So, uh, welcome back to uh, this Jesus Apologetics series. We're in week four. And I know sometimes it's a little hard to come in from a busy week. I'm sure we all are having and try to get our minds to start thinking about apologetics, top, these apologetics topics. And uh, I definitely can understand that. So uh, if you need to like zone out or fall asleep or play on Facebook while you're talking, that's fine. As long as you are only thinking about this class and posting about this content, you're totally at liberty to do that. Anyway, uh, for the new people here, um, we do have a Facebook group. Um, and if, if you aren't new and you're not in the Facebook group, I would encourage you to check it out because that's where I'm going to be posting updates for all future classes. Uh, if you're new, we have um, several classes. It's a, it's a full series of stuff um, from scientific apologetics to um, biblical apologetics to theological apologetics. So it's, it's going to be like a year and a half long worth of, of classes. Um, so that's a little bit of the background of the class. Now, also, for those of you who have been coming, in your Spiral Bound book, I haven't shared that yet, but at the front, there's a Intro to Apologetics section. Now, I had that same section in the Biblical Apologetics book, but I repeated it here because many times people are um, struggling to know why we're doing what we're doing. And I want to point you to that because you may think, well, Jeremy, you just need the Holy Spirit. Or, Jeremy, you just need to evangelize. Or, Jeremy, you just need to uh, trust God. You know, these sorts of things. Have blind faith sort of thing. So that section there called Intro, Introduction to Apologetics kind of gives a little bit of background for why we're doing what we're doing. And I want to encourage you to go there if you ever struggling to find out what is the background of this class, why do we have this class, and why do we think that Christians need this class and non-Christians need this class. So that's there for you. It's repeated. It's also in the Biblical Apologetics one, but I just want to make sure that you're aware of that, and uh, if you feel like giving that book to somebody in the future, you know, that would be good for them to read too if they're new to it. Now this series, again, is a very... Um, non-difficult series. It's, it's, it's not elementary or anything like that, but it's not the hardest thing we do. So uh, if this is easy for you, that's great. Um, you'll be challenged later on. Um, what else? Oh, after the class, I do have to take off pretty quickly after. So like 9.05 or so, I have to go because we're, we're going down to San Diego tonight. And uh, we have an early morning conference, so unfortunately I won't be able to stay and chat like I normally do till like midnight um, <laughs> with that one guy, Chris, with the beard in the back. <laughs> he always tells me about his, uh, I, I won't even say. Uh, <laughs> he's got a weird relationship with his pet dog, I don't know. <laughs> he talks about it quite a lot. Anyway... Um, so we don't have a handout tonight for your, your book, but we did have one last week that we did not actually get into. If you remember, it had to do with um, Jesus coming as the Good Shepherd and how that was more than just a feel-good Sunday school story. It had a lot to do with the book of Ezekiel. And we left that blank, and we said we were going to come back to it. Now, um, at the end of this course, I'd like to send off the revised or let's call it the updated uh, PDF of the, what you have there. So this will be a good hard copy for you to have, the, the spiral bound book, but uh, I'll, I'll also send you a, the, very most, the most current version of what you have there electronically so that when you do get into those wonderful conversations with your friends online, you can just copy and paste and plagiarize to death because I'm, I want you to do that. We need more Christian voices online, and I'd love for you to just copy and paste out of the PDF a bunch of stuff and kind of give them something to think about. Um, so again, it's not about winning an argument. It's about winning the, the person and winning the culture. So we are in a culture war, obviously. The Supreme Court yesterday or the day before had uh, hearings on 
same-sex marriage, so if we don't realize we're in a culture war and we believe the postmodern folks who tell us we're not in a culture war and we don't need to have that kind of language as Christians, we're going to lose the culture war because we don't believe we're in it. So um, now having said that, this is all about humility again, folks, and I want to just urge you to understand again where I come from with all this. I'm still a student. I learn every day. I spent the last weekend revamping the notes you have in front of you, and I'll, I'll kind of give you a little bit of stuff as we go for you to kind of add in, but um, I went to you know UCI and spent time in the library studying some of this stuff, so I, I'm constantly learning, and the reason why I share that is because it is a lifelong journey. This is all about um, becoming better Christians, be becoming better followers of Jesus and loving him better with our minds. So, I come to you with a, a very uh, open mind and humble heart, and I hope that uh, you can bring some insights tonight as you normally do to the class session. So with that said, why don't we go ahead and pray and get into this. Dear God, we just come before you and ask that you would guide our time. Lord, let our hearts be open to understanding you maybe differently than we ever have before. And we ask that you would Increase, increase our awareness of, of your presence in our lives. And do that tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. So, we're going to start off where we left off last week. And we, we kind of left off talking about the identity evidence. And we, when we say identity evidence, we were referring to this idea that Jesus thought he was God. So when he self-reflected, he considered who he was and what he was, and he thought of himself as God. Now, we talked about how no other founder of any world religion had that kind of self-understanding. Jesus was the only one. And so this is very exciting for the Christian because it sets, him, it sets, it sets us apart. So Dr. Peter Kreft, he said they had to either believe his almost unbelievable claim of being God or disbelieve his very believable person. So they were faced with this choice. And again, this is in your notes at the top of page 88 in the upper right-hand corner, but also page 6 of 9 in the identity evidence section. So, do you believe his almost unbelievable claim of being God, or you disbelieve a very believable person? And so that's where we left off last week. So, we're talking about whether or not we can understand Jesus as also a divine figure as he understanding himself to be. So who was this guy? Well, he was either a wise sage, a moral philosopher, a trusted teacher, or a prophet, if you are a non-Christian. That's typically what you'd go for, one of those four. Now, from this list, we all, um, including the secular humanist, the conservative Christian, the Muslim, the Jew, Everybody essentially can easily affirm these things. And we all agree. But the question is, was Jesus more than a wise teacher? Was he more than a prophet? Was he more than a philosopher? So C.S. Lewis chimes in here with a very, very famous quote, and I'm sure you've heard of this before. He says, what I'm trying to, here to prevent anyone from saying, the really foolish thing that people often say, about him. I am ready to accept Jesus as a moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say, Lewis says. A man who really, who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level of a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make a choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, 
or else is a madman or something worse. So Lewis here says that someone can't just say he was a great moral teacher only, and that is what everyone says. If you walk up to anybody on the street and you ask them who was Jesus, at minimum they're going to say he was a good teacher. He said some good stuff about morality. He kind of knew what he was talking about when he spoke about the human condition and the plight of humanity. So in that sense, he's a good guy. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt and say that about him, but I don't know much more. So people typically say that. Now, C.S. Lewis basically, in his quote, gives us three options. Lewis says he was either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. So in that big quote we read, he was either a liar, a lunatic, or the Lord. Now, if you say that he was a liar, you got a tough case to build and, and make. It's a hard sell. If you say that he was a lunatic, it's even tougher. If you say that he was Lord, then you seem to be aligning yourself with the evidence. So we're going to talk about that, the liar option. If Jesus was not God and knew he was not God, he was deliberately lying. Option two, he's a lunatic. If Jesus was not God, but did not realize that he was not, he was a lunatic. Or option three, he was the Lord. Now, are there any other options than these? We're going to talk about um, the liar and the lunatic as we go here. And again, Jesus claimed he was the Lord. So, yes, there's actually two more options than the Lord, liar, lunatic trilemma. There's um, two options that Peter Kreft provides. Peter Kreft is a philosopher, um, I think, on the East Coast. Sorry? Oh, and um, he helps us understand these other options. Well, it's possible that Jesus was a God. Jesus was a God. So let's hold on to the, li the liar, lunatic part. And let's talk about this fourth option. Was he a God? Jesus claimed to be God, but what he meant was he was a God, just as we are all gods. This option, though, is clearly unsatisfactory. First, its reliance is on a pantheistic data that is simply not found in the Gospels. It could be thought of as a New Age or kind of a Hindu interpretation Nothing Jesus said or his followers understood even closely remembers the, the A-God of many gods scenario as they lived in a monotheistic culture and Jesus clearly claimed the monotheistic Jewish God role when he claimed, I am. So that doesn't work on that point alone. If you're in first century Palestine and you're a Jew, you clearly have a monotheistic understanding of who God is and, and all things spiritual relates to that monotheistic hierarchy. Now, second, if Jesus was a God, he was a terribly bad teacher because no one, friends or enemies, actually understood what he meant. The only people that think he was a God are the people who live now, 2,000 years later, and we are the only ones, us smart, liberally-minded um, enlightened, rational folks mean that he, he, we know what he meant. He meant that he was a god of many gods. But this is obviously culturally arrogant of us. Um, and we should not be so arrogant because when we read the New Testament and we read the other writers of the time, they all were very keenly aware that Jesus meant what he said that he was the I am. And he demonstrated that in various ways and sayings like we talked about last week in the evidence above. So it's ridiculous to think that Jesus was a God of many gods, and that's what he meant, because Jesus was a Jew and lived among Jews, and the main teaching of Judaism is the Shema. Who can recite the Shema for us? I know you can. Go for it. Perfect. Man, you even sang it for us. That's pretty good. Well done. I say it every week. Okay. The Lord... Is it, 
Yeah, mathematically speaking, great. So how do I answer that? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So your point is that because God's an infinite being, there couldn't be any other being like Him. He encompasses and exhausts all space time in terms of spirituality. If we can think of spirituality in such a way. Yeah, Wayne. I heard a five-year-old explain it very well. Okay, that'll help us. I'm sure. God, God fills the entire universe. There's no room for. Anything. <laughs> that's good. That, I like that. that. That's a five <laughs> Perfect. The wisdom of our children. Yes. So in the one Ahad, it's a it's a compound unit. Mm. It's not a singular one. It's like husband and wife are one. Yeah. So it, it works. Yeah, you get really the Trinity in the Old Testament without um, without thinking about it at at face value. It's it's there. Yeah, You're digging a little deeper. So, um, at the time in first century Palestine, if you were to contradict the Shema, you were in big trouble. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, and everybody else would be really mad at you and probably throw stones at you. Now, Jesus, when he was saying who he was, he was saying he was God, and what happened? They started throwing stones at him. So his life was threatened, and there were plots to kill Jesus, and it made sense, because everybody knew what he was saying. He was saying he was God. There was no, I'm one God amongst other gods. He was contradicting, in their eyes, the Shema in Deuteronomy. Now, option four fails on multiple levels, as we just talked about. So, when you talk about the option, well, he thought he was a God of, amongst many gods when he claimed to be God, that option doesn't work. Option five is interesting. This option denies the data. So it denies that Jesus claimed to be God. He, they say that he actually never said he was God. He never claimed to be God. No one thought he claimed that. So this option is clearly unsatisfactory due to, one, the data in the Gospels is clear, concise, and compelling. Uh, so see above. Again, last week we talked about the evidence of him claiming to be God. Now, again, this, when we talk about the identity evidence, we're not talking about the divinity evidence. We're just talking about the evidence of his claims to be God or his demonstration uh, that, that points to the validity of his claim. So the identity evidence is very separate from the divinity evidence. So right now we're just talking about whether or not he claimed to be God, not talking about whether or not he actually was God. So, the Gospels is clear. It's very clear that Jesus is claiming to be God in many ways. We talked about that last week. Besides the far left fringe wing of the Jesus Seminar, again, that liberal group of scholars who dismiss certain teachings in the Gospels, like we talked about last week, as being non-historical, besides those guys, uh, there's not too many people who think that Jesus denied being God, or denied claiming to be God. Uh, so this ultimately entails that the disciples all fabricated the data that Jesus said he was God. That is, the real Jesus never claimed to be God, but the disciples lied and said he did. So this is how it goes if you follow through with this thought. But why would the disciples lie? What selfish reason would they have, like fame or financial gain, for lying? We know that the disciples were all tortured and killed for their belief, except John, who was exiled. And they did not retract anything that they claimed. So if they were lying, they never confessed they were lying, even in the midst of torture and death. So option five fails, because the disciples clearly went to their deaths saying that Jesus said he was God. So there's no reason to do that if he actually didn't say he was God. So in terms of the identity evidence, option four and option five don't work. So now we're back to C.S. Lewis's trilemma. Um, let's see here. Moving this along. Now, was Jesus a liar? Could he have been deliberately lying? Could he have been deliberately lying? 
Could Jesus have been walking around Jerusalem and Galilee and Nazareth and Capernaum and all these places just spitting out lies through his whole ministry? Could that be a realistic option? Well, if he was lying, he would be the biggest hypocrite because he taught his disciples to be moral and honest. So that's very clear in his teaching. If he was lying, he would be a fool because they crucified him for his self-proclamation and he spent his whole life living a lie if he was lying to be God. That is essentially why he was crucified, because he continued to make strong statements while on trial, and they killed him because of it. Blasphemy is the high priest tore his robes when he says, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, like we talked about last week, when we talked about what the Son of Man actually meant. It meant he was claiming to be God. So he knew his calling the whole time, his whole ministry. He knew his calling was to be a ransom in the place of many. So he was clearly on that divine mission the whole time to be a ransom in the place of many. He knew that. So he would be really ridiculous to keep lying and then keep going down this journey knowing that it's a lie. If he originally set out to be on his course of death, based on something he knew he was a lie, he would be a fool for choosing such a life and death. So if he was lying, he would have been a demon. All of this at the same time. So hypocrite, a fool, and a demon, if Jesus deliberately was lying. Because he told others, like a demon would, to trust him for their eternal destiny. So that's not good. You don't want to tell people... to trust you for their eternal destiny, unless you can back it up. So in summary, if he was lying, he would be a hypocrite, fool, and demon, but this is completely contrary to the data we have in the Gospels. So, what we could say in conclusion is that, no, Jesus was not a liar. Someone who taught, lived, and died like Jesus would never be thought to be a liar. When you look at his life, when you look at the data that we have, it makes absolutely no sense to say that Jesus was deliberately lying. And it doesn't make sense to say that he was a God amongst many gods, and it doesn't make sense to say that he um, never claimed to be God. So historian Philip Schaff, he says, a character so original, so complete, so uniformly consistent, so perfect, so human, and yet so high above all human greatness, can neither be fraud nor a fiction. How could an imposter, that is, a deceitful, selfish, depraved man, have invented and consistently maintained from the beginning to the end the purest and noblest character known in history with the most perfect air of truth and reality? It would be more, it would take more than a Jesus to invent a Jesus. And I think that quote says a lot. I think that quote is very important and and summarizes this section well. So we can conclude that Jesus firmly believed that he was the Son of God and could not have been deliberately lying. So this is important, although it sounds simple. We, We need to, as Christians know that Jesus at least thought of himself as being God. Now, the next step is, was he God? That's what we need to go to next. But first, we want to make sure that we're not worshiping Jesus if he didn't even think he was God, because that would be kind of foolish of us. So we got to figure that out first. So Lewis gives us a few options, the Lord, liar, lunatic, trilemma. One, he was not a liar. We've established that here. So the identity evidence helps us understand that Jesus was not lying and all these options that we could think of of what to do with his claims, those options don't work. So we're, we're stuck with the Lord or the lunatic option. So the lunatic option is given to you uh, in the psychological evidence tab in your handout. Now I just wanted you to turn there real quick. We're actually not going to go through that because it's actually so simplistic that it's easy reading Um, and it's not worth actually going through, but we're going to spend more of our time tonight on some other stuff in the divinity evidence section. So if you go to your tab there, 
in the psychological evidence section, you could see it follows a similar format as what we've been uh, working through. And you can uh, note there that um, it's talking about similar stuff. So the psychological evidence is, is essentially evidence showing that Jesus, Jesus' psychological state was very healthy and he was not a lunatic. So there's a um, professional psychologist there that talks a little bit about that. Uh, when you evaluate the data in the Gospels, we come up with someone who is so healthy and so rational and so um, perfectly um, balanced in his emotions and his thought life that there's no way anybody could charge him as being a lunatic. In fact, in comparison, when we stand up to, to compare ourselves with Jesus, we all seem to be more like lunatics than he does. So that's one good thing, I think, to keep in mind, um, that uh, we're not as uh, balanced as we all think we are. Now, okay, so having said that, we're going to move to the di divinity evidence section. And again, going back to the Good Shepherd handout, uh, last week, um, and talking about what that means and how when Jesus says, I am the Good Shepherd, he's saying he's God. And we're going to skip that because I'm going to send you the PDF and I'll ha have the answers for the fill-in-the-blanks there. Um, uh, yeah, when you read the book of John, I want you, next time you read it, to underline all of these I am statements. I am the resurrection. I am the door. I am the Good Shepherd. I am the whatever. And, and, and go through that. And, and then, after you go work your way through John, looking for his claims to divinity, uh, the identity evidence, if you will, go back into the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and do the same thing. It's a little bit more challenging there, though, because John's whole purpose is to show off Jesus' divinity. That's John's purpose. He's really trying to explain to his audience that Jesus was God. 100%. So... But then, if you go back into Matthew, Mark, Luke, it gets a little bit more challenging. And, and that's where the treasures are. So I just want to encourage you on your journey to, to dive into that. Uh, are there any questions before we start the divinity evidence section on the identity evidence conversation, this Lord, liar, lunatic stuff? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about that, yeah, oh, the, in this part, yeah, that's good. Chris? I have a silly question, but just because I was in a debate last night with someone that wanted the evidence for Jesus, and uh, I was like, well, what if Jesus is God, and you know, he's just like, and he's Yeah. The, the trouble is knowing the context of the conversation. If you're on like a two month long conversation, you know, and there's time to get into the reliability of the Gospels, then yes, definitely use the evidence within the Bible uh, because it's incredibly great evidence. Of course, most people at, at face value will not trust your religious literature because they're not comfortable with it. It's like when someone pops open Joseph Smith's Book of Mormon, we're just like, ah, yeah, you know, and, and the same thing with the Quran or something. So we have to establish credibility, reliability of the Bible before we can use the Bible in our conversations, unless they are already open to that and not needing that step-by-step um, that -step process. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what I would say is that it, depending on the conversation, you may be able to use all of this great evidence here if they're willing to hear what the Bible has to say. 
Um, the trouble is people just think of the Bible as they think of the Quran and the Book of Mormon. It's just dropped down from heaven from God, and therefore it's like uh, this allegedly miraculous book is here. Why do I want to even dabble into that? Uh, I know it's full of weird fables and stories. So, yeah, we just have to be mindful of where they're at already before we use it. Now, if they're already open to hearing the gospel, of course, we don't want to even bother with this pre-evangelism and this apologetics because they're just ripe fruit, right? Ready to hear it and maybe submit their life to the Lord. Okay, other questions? All right, so let's go ahead and start this section. Now, I guarantee you tonight, you're going to hear something. Well, let me, before I say that, let me ask you this. Okay, let me ask you this question in a couple sentences here. <laughs> so um, this, this outline here we could kind of ignore for a little while. So I'll, uh, because it's not worth, I think, um, having the, just a bunch of letters up there when you have it in front of you. And so it's kind of hard to read anyway. So I'm not quite fond of PowerPoints unless they've got a lot of photos. So... <laughs> <laughs> intermission. It's, it's intermission. Please silence your cell phone. Announcements. We've done that. Oh, there's some missionaries you could support. Okay, so we'll see what happens. Sorry. Okay, so the divinity evidence. Um, the divinity evidence. So... The popular challenges that we hear tend to be pretty strong when it comes to Jesus being God. So people sometimes say, Jesus denied having divine attributes. So this is a different challenge than what we just talked about when people say Jesus denied ever claiming to be God. This is a little different, so we'll talk about that. Another challenge Christians are faced with is, um, people say that he was a God-man, and this is a self-contradiction and is unintelligible. So when Christians say that he was God and man, Christians are saying something that's completely incoherent. It's something that you just don't know what to do with that because the statement itself doesn't make sense. You can't be God and man. That is a self-contradiction. Now, other people sometimes say something like this. The disciples of Jesus merely copied from the life of Ap Apollonius, excuse me, of Tyana, to create the story of Jesus. So Apollonius of Tyana was a figure who lived back then around that time. And so some people say that the disciples actually stole uh, the story about Jesus from this guy. So what do Christians say in response to that? Other people say that the legend of Jesus is simply a retelling of similar stories from ancient mystery religions such as Mithraism. So there were all these weird religions going on back then in caves and forests and things like that, and they, scholars refer to those as mystery religions. And they're kind of like cultish nomad groups that wander about and everything. And um, people say that the disciples who wrote about Jesus copied from these mystery religions when they formulated the story and gave us the Gospels. So what do Christians say in response to these challenges? Well, we've got some questions now we need to consider. First, what evidence does Jesus provide that support his claims of deity? And second, do the alternative stories discredit the accounts that we have of Jesus? Do these mystery religions and Apollonius of Tyana, do they discredit the accounts that we do have of Jesus? So these are the questions that we're going to look at at this time. Now, the divinity evidence. Let's just start right into it. We have 10 different evidences from Jesus that show the divinity of Jesus. 10. So the first we can say is that he performed miracles, many miracles, and he used his miracles to prove his deity to people. Now, last time we talked about the identity evidence. He's saying, I am God, 
And now we're saying, here's his miracle that showed that he was God. It validated his claim to be God. So he performed many miracles and used his miracles to prove his deity to people. He didn't just say he was divine. He proved it with the miracle. So and he healed people. He raised dead people to life. He cast out demons. He modified water and manipulated and multiplied food. He walked on water. And he controlled the weather. In each case, he was proving he was divine. He was backing up specific claims he was making at the time to, to prove that he was divine. Now, if he does the miracle successfully, his words and claim to divine authority is true and credible. If he doesn't perform the miracle correctly and successfully, then his claim that he's just making is not true and credible. So think of that. He's really putting himself on a, out there on a... Um, he's, he's walking a fine line, isn't he? Because if the miracle isn't successful, people are going to look at him as a failure. And they're going to walk away. No one's going to follow him. So he's making strong claims, and he's backing them up throughout the Gospels. Now, the second line of evidence that we have was he was without sin. Only God was thought to be sinless. So if you're a first century Jew in the Palestine area, the only person that does not need the blood of the lamb to remove the sin from his family for that year was God. All of us, Jews, if you will, we all are sinners. So Jesus is the only one claiming to be without sin, and this is a huge statement. The disciples, Pilate, the soldier at the cross, the thief on the cross, all confirmed he has done nothing wrong. First Peter later talks about he was a lamb without blemish of defect. He, him who knew no sin, Paul says, who knew no sin, became sin for us, right? This is known in theology as the impeccability of Christ. So there's your, your, your big word there that you're paying the big bucks for here. The impeccability of Christ. Um, now, when, when theologians are talking about the impeccability, peccare is the Latin for sin. So they're saying the non-sin of Christ when they're talking about the impeccability. And they're also saying he was not able to sin. When you're talking about the impeccability, you're talking about his inability to sin. So here's a question for the class, and this is what seminary professors do and talk about when they reach this point in the systematic theology class. They open up the classroom, which I'm going to do now, to discuss whether or not Jesus could have sinned. So, could Jesus have sinned? No. He's unchangeable. He's unchangeable. Okay. It contradicts who he is. Okay. Chris? I don't know if we're getting over technical or mind being over mental, but he could, but I don't think he would. Can't. Okay, tell us what you mean. Tell us what you mean. What do you mean? I'm just saying is it possible? I mean, with God, all things are possible, so he could, but will he? I guess is maybe how I say he would and could. So. Yeah. That's a good point. So if you're tempted to sin, here's another question for you. If you're tempted to sin, great point. Um, does that mean that you have the ability to sin? Yes. Caroline, hold on. Yes. Okay. The, when he, when uh, Satan was tempting him yes, in the yes. desert. Yes. Oh. Another question. Another question. I don't know that that can answer this question. If God can create a rock that he cannot lift. Okay. Can God create a rock he cannot lift? 
okay, so can he do the impossible sort of thing? Or, or, or do those things even make sense to say? That's very interesting. And it, what you're saying is that maybe this is completely incoherent as an idea. Like the question, can God make a rock you cannot lift? That's such an incoherent question. Isn't that like a dumb thing? Say it again. Isn't that like a dumb thing? A yeah. dumb thing? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know if it's that dumb because a, a seminary professor of mine in grad school, he was talking about can God create a rock you can't live with us in class. And so it was, I don't know, I can't even remember his answer. It was so complicated. <laughs> And so I, I don't know, I don't, to me, I thought it was pretty um, complicated, yeah. I think you could identify with us. We have the, we have the um, human nature, but we okay. have our sinful nature. Okay, yeah. So you could identify yeah. with us, and so he could struggle, but he would not do it, but the struggle he had to experience to, it says to learn obedience. Okay, that's very good. Mm. These are very, this is great, you guys. Yeah. Temptation is different from sin, yes. Yeah, Lisa. I was wondering when he was a little boy, how did he get to be, you know, get growing to be a man and not ever sin? How did Jesus as a little boy get through that stage and get to be 30 years old when he started his ministry and never have sinned? Good question. <laughs> yeah, John. Mm. So the answer was, uh, he is actually the, he's resembling the Ten Commandments. Mm. So that question cannot be addressed to him. Mm. Interesting. So he's kind of beyond his own moral code, so to speak, because he is morality itself. He is goodness itself. Interesting. Okay. If Jesus, if God, if God is goodness itself, and Jesus is God, then G is Jesus also beyond morality? Could he have done whatever he want and got away with it because he's beyond morality, just like he's essentially, as some people think, beyond space-time? He's a manifestation of uh, morality. Other thoughts? Wayne? He, he could be tempted, but I don't believe he can sin. He is the light of the world, but in him is no darkness at all. What is darkness? What is light? There is no darkness at all in Jesus Christ. So he could have been tempted, but he couldn't have sinned. He, because it would, like I said before, it would contradict who he is. Who is the core of who he is? Can he make a rock so heavy he can't lift it? Well, you're asking a question that's ridiculous. He can make <laughs> any size rock. He can make any weight rock. But he can't make a rock he can't lift. <clears throat> Yeah, Fred. I think uh, James chapter 1, verse 13 says, uh, when no one says he's tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Mm -hmm. And so I think the humanity of Jesus and him living the full experience of, of, of uh, humanness mm -hmm. makes him worthy to be our high priest and, and uh, identify with us when we do sin. As First John says, he's our advocate, mm -hmm. peace with the Father. Interesting. So he, he, was, he was tempted. He couldn't sin, but he was tempted so that he could identify with other hu humans who do sin. Yeah. Caroline. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So, so if he wasn't capable of sinning, could he really have overcome the human condition? No. Okay. Um, Tell us why. Because humans aren't capable. Um, it's not that God made a mistake. Our free will doesn't get us to heaven. I guess. Our free, we, we were given free will. And we, what, what looked good, what seemed normal, what seemed right, what seemed like a, the, best, the best solution did not cut it. It was a deceit that humans weren't ready for that, that level of deceit. And, and Jesus, he, he, but he picked up the tab. He, he took the responsibility by putting himself in that predicament and overcoming really quite, but, but, quite a, a gift. But, but why, how could he have overcome if he couldn't, if he didn't have the ability to sin? Dan. Okay. But in the full, because what's the significance of him being having a sinless life? If you can't sin, who cares? Mm. It doesn't. It's insignificant. This is the heart of it, because when you add in all of these um, seemingly conflicting motives, one uh, who uh, we are all, at one time trying to say that he's completely and ultimately divine. And at the other time, we're trying to say that he's completely and ultimately human. And what it does it mean to be human? We know what it means to be divine. We know that divine means you cannot sin because your perfect goodness, there's light and no darkness, you know that. But what is it to be human? What is it to be Adam? What was it like to be Eve in the garden prior to the sinful nature coming into the garden, what was their nature like? They were sinless, but somehow had the ability to sin. Their hearts were postured and bent towards righteousness and God-fearing and worshiping God and fellowship and communion with God until that day happened and the fall of man happened, right? Then they had a different nature enter in. They had the nature that also wanted to worship God and also wanted to, to somehow obey because that was their original state. So there's this kind of dormant quality to, to them. But now they were bent on selfishness. So Martin Luther said sin is the heart bent in on itself. And it, start, it happened that way, it bent in on itself because originally it was bent and inclined towards God. But because of the fall, the heart became bent in on itself and wanted to worship itself. And so Jesus then inherits this weird human nature that's inclined originally to God, but inclined to itself. So if you're inclined to yourself as a human, now again, this is the sinful state that Jesus enters into. Does he have an internal inclination towards himself? Or does he have Adam's original inclination only towards God and God worship? So this is the heart of the issue. And theologians have been wrestling this with this for 2,000 years. So if you go open up scholarly, scholarly textbooks uh, and systematic theology books from Wayne Grudem, Millard Erickson, the, the most widely used systematic theology textbooks in Christian colleges and seminaries today, those two, they will have a section on the impeccability of Christ. And then you start looking back into William G.T. Shedd and, and Charles Hodge last century, and then go back even further to Calvin and, and Luther and Melanchthon and other reformers. Um, they talk about it there as well, uh, Aquinas and, and back, back, back. And you, you just get this wealth of literature on the impeccability of Christ. And it's pretty fascinating. So I encourage you to go further. <laughs> there is no, there's no answer that I can tell you as the answer, other than most people lean towards more of he was not able to sin, but that's as far as they'll go. It's kind of like you make minimal statements so you don't get yourself in trouble as a theologian. 
but you're, it's like you kind of don't want to even say he was not able to sin, but you kind of lean towards that as a, as a theologian. And you're, if you just kind of say, well, I hold the view loosely that it seems that he was not able to sin because in his God nature, he can't sin. But uh, then I don't know, because he was completely human too. So, so theologians get a little like uh, tongue twisted there when you ask them. Yeah, Wayne. Well, it's, it's, it's quite... And his mission would be bankrupt. Okay, it, I, I hear where you're going with that. I, I get you. Again, the motive there, what you're trying to balance out, you know, because, it's trippy. Because why did, why did he come? What, what was the reason that he came? Uh, let's, let's do this. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the dual natures of Jesus. And, and just again, slightly, we talked a little bit about it last week. And we'll, we'll finish off the class. Okay, so let's take a break, and we'll be back in five minutes, okay? So the impeccability of Christ, going back to that, you're free now, and you now are licensed and authorized to fully investigate the impeccability of Christ for the rest of your life. Uh, you have the permission now. So you pass the test, you're free to go, and figure it out on your own. All right, so the third line of evidence that we have, the third line of evidence that we have is that he forgave sins. He forgave sins. So the most striking feature of Jesus' life that points to his divinity is his forgiving of sin. Only God and other persons who are wronged uh, could forgive sin. So if, if I sin against Wayne, I need to come to Wayne to, to repent and apologize, and he needs to forgive me, and vice versa. If I sin against Jack, and God forgives me, then that makes sense. But if I sin against Jack, and Wayne forgives me, that doesn't make sense. The only person who can forgive sins that happen here to each other is God. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, we're sinning against Him. Our hearts are ultimately in rebellion against Him. So the only, it only makes sense when Jesus said He was forgiving people of their sins when He healed them, that He was claiming and demonstrating at the same time to be God. So the scribes correctly respond in Mark chapter 2, who can forgive sins but God alone? So Jesus had said here, he went, um, uh, entered Capernaum in this story in Mark chapter 2, and they gathered in this, this area. Jesus was preaching the word, and people brought to him a paralyzed man, and they were carried by four people. He was carried by four, and they couldn't get in, and they, they dug through. They lowered him down to Jesus. Jesus looks at him, He's paralyzed, he's lying on the mat, and he doesn't first say, get up and walk. He says, sons, your sins are forgiven. Whoa, what, huh? Who says that? So this is exactly what the, the Pharisees said. They said, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So Jesus is ultimately saying there in this healing moment, I have the authority to forgive sins. So this is extremely interesting. Um, theology professor Michael Bird, he says, clearly Jesus' declaration of forgiveness in such a context, context was tantamount to assuming the authority to forgive on God's behalf. Jesus claims for himself unmediated divine authority. Authority. So the third evidence is that Jesus forgives sins, and that is evidence of his divinity. And then number four, he accepted worship. He accepted worship. So the Old Testament forbids anybody from accepting worship. Only God can accept worship. So angels and disciples in the New Testament 
actually rejected worship when it came to them. If you remember when Peter went to Cornelius' house, they actually um, did something in the form of worshiping him. I can't remember exactly what it was. I don't know if it's they bowed or not. But they, and in Revelation, the, the angel was starting to receive worship. And both Peter and the angel rejected the worship because they knew that only God is worthy of worship. So when Jesus was worshiped, he accepted it and did not tell people to stop because he's only a man. He didn't say anything. He just let them worship him because people knew that he was God. So when he healed the leper, people worshiped him. Uh, When the disciples were in the boat after Jesus walked on water and and resurrected, the disciples worshiped him. The Canaanite woman, she worshiped him. The mother of James and John worshiped him. The demon-possessed man worshiped him. The blind man worshiped him. So he accepted worship. And that is evidence of his, of his divinity. And then another point. Um, he accepted the title of my Lord and my God by Thomas. This is what Jack was talking about earlier. When Thomas was able to see the physical body of the resurrected Lord, he said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus accepted that incredible title. He wasn't just saying, you are a great teacher. Or you are a good philosopher technically rigorous as the best of them. Uh, No, he was saying, my Lord and my God, something much more beyond a teacher's title. Uh, And then six, he changed people's names, something only God does as the Hebrew names refer to their identity and the destiny that God had designed them to have. So when God gives someone a name in the Old Testament or changes somebody's name in the Old Testament, Jesus was doing that in the New Testament, and he was changing people's names and giving people's na- giving people names, and only God does such a thing. Um, seven, he spoke with power and authority that others recognized. So the mob of soldiers fell down and spoke, I am, uh, when he said, I am he, they fell down. They drew back and fell to the ground. Uh, when he said, uh, or the, the follower said, no one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards declared. So they recognized that Jesus spoke with authority. Um, The people were astonished, Matthew writes, for he taught them as one with authority. So there, again, is evidence that he was uh, having an authority to him that was unparalleled at their time. Item 8. His divinity was confirmed by voices from heaven at his baptism and transfiguration. Now, you can't get any more clear than this. When God is speaking from heaven in an audible voice, um, this is extreme, okay? So the transfiguration really makes sense when you start understanding the divine nature of Jesus. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, Evidence number nine, he prophesied his own death and resurrection and fulfilled it. Now, it's, some people have claimed they've done miracles, But it's hard to do a miracle when you're dead. So no matter who you are, when you're dead, you really can't do any miracles. So Jesus was dead, and he did the miracle of raising himself from the dead. Now, this is incredible, but what's even more incredible is he said he was going to do it. He said he was going to die and then come back to life. That's nuts. So when you are talking about evidence... This is big-time evidence. Only a God could die and still have the power to come back to life. Uh, And number 10, he ascended into heaven. So obviously, if you're ascending into heaven, there's something pretty amazing going on with you. All right. Now, another line of evidence, you could say, is that we have um, his followers being fully convinced he was God incarnate. So the scriptural, scriptural data for this is, is pretty overwhelming. So when you have a group of people that you spend three years with, either everybody gets annoyed with each other and hates each other after that, or something crazy happens like what we see in the Gospels and, and the aftermath, where they all came out of that three years saying he was God. And none of them said anything different. Um, Now, so all of this evidence adds up to build a full case of his divinity. So, 
this is kind of the background for how we respond to these challenges that we are faced with. So the first challenge we talked about was Jesus denied having divine attributes. Well, critics like Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons say that he was born of God and not co-eternal with the Father because they reference these passages where Jesus uh, talks about being begotten in John 3.16 and firstborn in Colossians 1.15 and good in Mark 10.18. So the J-dubs also reinterpret John 1, 1 through 3, to say what they want, but that's a different story. So when you're talking about begotten firstborn, what do we do with that as evangelical Christians? Well, in order to respond to the J-dubs, we'll call them, because um, I'm from the ghetto, so I use ghetto <laughs> slang. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. They haven't kicked me out of Irvine yet, but they will. I know they will. Um, now, begotten means unique and beloved. Begotten means unique and beloved. So if you ever look at um, Tim Tebow's um, eye patch right here, it says John 3.16. Y'all know what I'm talking about? A little Tim Tebow action. He just got uh, contracted with the Card um, Eagles. Again, so we'll see what happens. Card no, Cardinals? Eagles. Eagles. Okay, so that it's important you know that. Um, so... Begotten means unique and beloved. Firstborn means, means supreme heir to the Father's inheritance. So you have these two words, begotten and firstborn. Does that mean that Jesus was born, like the Mormons say? Well, what do we do with that? Well, um, the original ancient Hebrew liter literal meaning, uh, the primogeniture, uh, was modified over time. And by the time of Jesus' day, it carried the connotation of succeeding in rights and possess in fullness. So initially, back in Abraham's time, it all meant that there was a, um, a literal begotten happening, that this boy was born as my firstborn, and I am transferring all of who I am to that firstborn, so he gets all the inheritance because he's essentially me. That was kind of the original context. Succeeding in rights, possess in fullness. In Colossians, you know, over the 2,000 years later, in Colossians 10.9, Paul clarifies this whole thing. Uh, when he talks about the nature of Jesus, he says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So in the same text as Colossians 1.15, the text where it says firstborn, Paul is actually being completely straightforward on the divine nature of Jesus. So when when Paul is talking about the firstborn in, the firstborn in, in Colossians 1.15, it must mean something other, that, other than Jesus was born. Because in the same passage, he says, all the fullness of the deity dwells. Now, what do we know first about God was that he's eternal. And if the fullness of God dwells in Jesus, then Jesus must be also eternal. So firstborn in the Colossians 1.15 context must not mean born. It must mean something other than born because Paul is clearly saying that Jesus is eternal in the same passage. So what does Paul mean when he says firstborn? Well, it could be some figurative notion to carry this sense of, of having the intrinsic deity in him the transferring of all who the Father is to the Son in that patriarchal culture of Abraham. And then secondly, in Mark, or yeah, Mark 10, 18, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Remember that passage? Yeah. Jesus only was, was helping the rich man here confirm what he was exclaiming. So it sounds, if you read it, that Jesus is saying, why are you calling me good? You should only be calling God good, and I'm not God. Why are you calling me good? It sounds like Jesus is kind of de uh, denying being God right here. Interesting. But if you look a little deeper, Jesus was not denying it. He was merely asking, do you know what it means when you say that about me? Do you know what you're saying when you call me good? What you're really doing is you are calling me God even though you don't necessarily realize it. And did Jesus deny that in that same passage? No. He goes on and carries on with the passage and the teaching, whatever. 
So Jesus accepts the good ascription that the person gives. Uh, again, this is not Jesus denying his divine attribute. So we don't have the denying of divine attributes with Jesus. And when Philippians 2 comes around, Paul says he emptied himself. Kenosis is the Greek. He emptied himself of his divine nature to take on somehow this God-man complex. And that's the next challenge we'll talk about. A God-man, they say, they challenge us, and they say that a God-man is a contradiction and unintelligible. You can't even think of it. It's an incoherent sort of concept. So now we're talking about Christology. We talked a little bit about this last week. And this is what, when theologians are talking about the doctrine of the nature, or the nature's plural, of Jesus. So according to John 1, 1 through 3, Jesus existed from the beginning. Um, and from the beginning, Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. So John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? Um, now here, the Bible is establishing, or John is establishing, this inseparable nature, this oneness of Jesus and the God of the universe. So in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the, the Word was with God, the Word was God. So, so clearly John is trying to make a really profound statement at the outset. Again, that's John's motive throughout the entire book, was to show off his divinity. He was not a person in which God just inspired, like Elijah or Moses, for example. He was not just that kind of God-indwelt person. He was not a schizophrenic with two separate minds, but was someone who had one personality with two distinct natures that were inseparable. And we talked a little bit about this last week. Humans have one body and one soul, right? So in a sense, we have kind of two natures, if you want to think of it that way. A soulish nature and a body-ish nature, okay? Jesus, the Logos, the second person of the Trinity, has one body and two natures. So you have uh, both of these, these natures being revealed in his, in his life here on earth. The divine was revealed at moments of his baptism and transfiguration. So um, at the very soon when he looked here, we talked about um, a little bit of that, what that could look like. And I'm sorry, I don't know how to draw the divine nature of Jesus, but what I'll do is just say that God existed, obviously, in the eternity past, and there is no beginning. So here's the existence of God. It's obviously, um, eternity past, eternity future, and somewhere along the line, um, there's creation, and he enters the space-time world, and he comes out of this static eternal time. Now he's omnitemporal as one Godhead, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Then he comes in, and he's incarnate, in, in the person of Jesus is incarnate here. We'll say M for Mary. Um, and <laughs> why not, right? Um, and then obviously the crucifixion and the ascension. And what's happening here? Well, the substance, the essence, the nature of God is the same, but something's happening with the person of one of the persons of God, if you will, where you have the ascension and the crucifixion. So the substance isn't changing. The person is moving about and doing different things. So what you have is Jesus, 100% God and 100% man. The divine logos, when John says in the beginning was the word, the Greek there is logos. So in the beginning was the logos. And what he's doing is he's borrowing the term from Hellenistic philosophy, or Greek philosophy, Socrates, Plato, and the whole thing. And he's saying that this word is the best word I can come up with to somehow describe the eternality of Jesus Christ, the man from Nazareth. The pre-existence of Jesus. See, when we're born, our existence starts there. 
But Jesus, when he was born, he had been existing from eternity past. And so into the future is always the case. Now, the personhood comes incarnate, he ascends, and he ascends with the same body that he was crucified in. So when he bears those scars that he had on the cross, he is burying them for eternity. So when we get to heaven, uh, we will see, I believe, the holes and the wounds forever and ever. Now, uh, this is not a contradiction. The early church fathers labored and labored for 300 years to figure out what do they do with the divine, with the biblical data on his divinity. And they produced a wonderful theological formulation that would um, make sense and justify the biblical account and show that it's not contradictory. And they did this in 451 AD at the, at the Council of Chalcedon. So it took them a long time, over 400 years, to figure out Jesus how he became a man. And what they came up with was a really good statement. You have it there. Let's go through it if you don't mind. Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, of a reasonable, rational soul and body, consubstantial, co-essential, with the Father, according to the Godhead, and consubstantial with us, according to the manhood, in all things like unto us, without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father, according to the Godhead, acknowledged in two natures, inconfusably, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the distinction of the natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, only begotten God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared and through him, and the Lord Jesus Christ taught himself, himself has taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed out to us. So we've been using some technical language that's translated consubstantial, subsistence, uh, co-eternal, these sorts of things. We're talking about nature and things like that. But what's important is the goal part. I want you to just pay attention to that and dwell on that. There are two natures that do not get merged into one. They remain separate, but united. They remain distinct, but not convoluted. They're indivisible, meaning that you cannot divide one nature into the other. They remain separate. They are not changed, and they cannot be confused. Now, he's a single person, he has one personality, and the dual natures, and the dual natures remain with him. And so this is what we talked a little bit about last week. We talked about homoousios being the Latin word for consubstantial or coessential or of the same substance or essence or nature. Meaning Jesus was consubstantial with the Father. He was coessential with the Father. He was of the same substance. He had one nature. And the hypostasis word, again, Latin, handed down to us from the church fathers who spoke Latin mainly at the time, Meaning subsistence or individual instance of an usia. Again, usia, weird word, but we're talking about substance when we say that word. So uh, I'm an individual instance of humanity, just like you are. The dog is an individual instance of um, the dog nature. He's an instantiation, a manifestation, if you will. And so what they're saying, the early church fathers, is to avoid heresy. You don't want to start expressing Jesus' as God nature too much, and you don't want to start expressing Jesus' as man nature too much, and you don't want to mix up the natures. You want to keep it just in this little box, because once you get outside the box, you're a heretic, and you're going to burn your life. <laughs> That's the idea. So um, this distinction is really important, because Arius got kicked out of the church, and a bunch of other people um, got kicked out of the church for their, their heresies. It's really fun to actually read about, unfortunately, but um, because it does kind of sharpen our, our doctrinal system. 
And the point, uh, one of the areas of apologetics that's really important is the theological apologetics area where people make fun of Christian doctrine because they think it's incoherent. So philosophical theology is very helpful for apologetics because it helps us to um, make our theological statements that we make as Christians not sound ridiculous. And if we can show that we're rational when we talk about these very complex things without contradicting ourselves, then we have some something to work with that they respect. Um, so it's very important that we don't confuse this because it will sound uh, very bad. The Mormons and the uh, Muslims have, I think, a very a big challenge because of, I think a lot of their doctrines are convoluted and contradictory. So, um, but thankfully we don't have that. Okay, now this is where we will essentially spend the rest of our time. Um, before we get into this next challenge, responding to that, does anyone have any questions on the last one? Yeah, totally. Right. About um, Christ coming death on the cross at that moment, face separate. Good question. Does anyone think it's that answer there? Could you repeat the question? When Christ still Was the Trinity still united, essentially, when Jesus died on the cross? Yes. Because he became sin. 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 Because he became sin for us. Is that your question? Okay. Does anybody want to try to take it? Well, <coughs> sin for us. Sin causes death. Death is separation. So from that three hours, Jesus paid the price for the sin. Whether they were separated or not, I don't have a verse for that one. Okay. Other thoughts? That's good. Although they became sin for us, God was in Christ. Let me know. We can put a lot of verses in now. Good stuff. I like it. Let's go to Althea here. So are you saying that just as body died, then what was one with the other part of him? Right. So do you want to respond and clarify? Yes. Elaborate? She has. That's right. Okay. If, if when his body died, what happened to his soul or nature? Yes. Yeah, so was he still God then? Because God did not have the same. Was he still God then at the, at the death? But he was fighting for us. So I think Did not he separated from his body in his death because he went to hell, right? And preached well to the soul. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. That's a great question. Because yeah. some people teach you when you became born again or something like that. Heresy that's out there. That was written around 380 says he went to hell. But there's no biblical data for that. So Ephesians, the church has revised it over time to get rid of that because of the way to interpret certain passages when he goes into the depths, you know, with the meaning. Other thoughts? Yes. Okay, so this probably goes back to the whole nature's thing. Because now Yeshua when he was born on earth didn't have a human father. Right? And then we had Joseph. Well I mean he was kind of adopted, but it was the Holy Spirit that came on Mary, she conceived, right? And um, and so I think there's a part of the human maybe it's the nature that did get implemented into him. So he was a pure Human without that sin nature, which uh, when he died, um, I think there's there's a factor in it. Okay. Okay. So you had a son of humanity, and then the humanity side died, the sin nature thing died, or something. Mm -hmm. 
It's a great question. Yes, John. To what question I have tried to write it down. I want to see whether it's a fallacy or not. So Satan is not powerful enough that he could not tempt <coughs> Jesus to sin. So that's what we, we saw that. Okay. So that's good. All right. Then can Satan tempt humans to sin that kill God the Son? Okay, so if Satan tempted all the humans that crucified Jesus, yeah. that Satan essentially led to the crucifixion? Right. To, to, Satan killed Jesus by through okay. tempting these human beings, which are responsible for Jesus' death. Okay. What did you say about what you say? First of all, I was just repeating what you said. What did he say? Maybe Satan led people to crucify Jesus through his tempting people. Um, other thoughts, though, on coming back to the question, what happened to the nature of, of Jesus and the natures of God at the moment of the death of Jesus? Let's go to front of the I think uh, his humanity definitely died, but his divinity didn't die, because God can't die if he's eternal. Um, wages of sin is death. Jesus is sinless, and he died. He had the sins of the world on him on the cross. Um, and so I think his separation from the Father was a real thing because it, it represents our punishment if he doesn't cover our sins. And uh, we don't have to bear that eternal punishment anymore because he broke the Lord for us. It's good that he, if his humanity died and his divine nature continued. Yeah. Yeah, Jack. We also look at um, about how he's referred to in Revelation. The lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth. We can't really get our brain around that. We'll think that it was part of the eternal, you know, when you talk about his eternity and his purpose. And it was a it was all it was planned before the foundation of the earth. Mm -hmm. And he was well even before his crucifixion, that was probably the worst. The hardest temptation going through it, mm -hmm. but he did. Yeah. One of the things that has perplexed scholars the most is the in the Bible is the um, "My God, My God, Why Have You Forsaken Me?" That passage is really hard to execute, and this question is very important. The only thing I could probably add to the conversation that you haven't already thought through is. Maybe coming back to this, where you have this pre existence, co eternal, consubstantial unity of Godhead continuing to exist through that. So it must be the case that God did not die on the cross. So we don't want to be loose with our language and say God died on the cross. We want to say Jesus the human died on the cross, and God the Son, the Logos, the pre existing Logos, continued through. Um, the crucifixion. So in essence, his personality, his personhood, never diminished. There was never a lights out moment for the personhood of Christ. At the same time, there probably is a lights out moment for us when we die, an awakening sometime in the future. Um, it's, it's hard to believe that we all have this continued existence immediately after death. You give us some biblical that. That's debatable. I don't want to go down the rabbit trail. The point is that it's pretty clear in the Gospels that there was not a lights out moment for the personhood of the Logos. But the human nature must have died. Otherwise, when they stabbed him on the cross, he would have jerked a little bit. You know? And so it's very, very clear in the Gospels he was dead dead. So the only thing that could actually be dead is a human and not a God. Um, yeah, last question on this one. Okay, that phrase, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? That's the first part of Psalm 22. And a lot of times when when the first verse of a portion is given, people would, at that time would think of that whole portion, which talks about the crucifixion. Yeah. And uh, that's yeah. part the, of it. Psalm 22 tends to be one of those chapters that I mentioned a couple weeks ago that has this all this messianic linked to prophecy to it, but I don't think of it as prophecy. I think of it as a, as a, a very indirect sort of a thing that Jesus is utilizing in different stages to show off um, his Davidic kingship and messiahship, but not in an explicit way as the Isaiah 
uh, sections go. Anyway, but yes, he is definitely referring to Psalm 22. But it's perplexing to see how there's a forsaking going on in in a direct sense. Yeah, last question on this. Um, well, the doctrine of the Trinity, um, the Trinity Fathers, is, uh, I guess it's not within the nature of the one God. There exists three co equal, co eternal persons the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The, the Father is fully God, the Son is fully God, yeah. and the Holy Spirit is fully God. So when Jesus died, some people say that when God died, you know, we do not without God for three days, while the Father and the Holy Spirit are we're still there. Yeah, okay. okay, so we gotta, we got to be careful. I think what you're saying is that we got to be careful when we talk through this. I think it's important to know that we, we don't want to say God the Son died. We want to say God, or Jesus the human died. So that's the only thing I can add to what you expressed with co-equal, you said, and co-eternal. Co I mean, those two things long. Now, what we don't want to do is compare the tree to an egg, a shell, a white, a yolk. Don't do that. It's heresy. Look it up online. How about a triangle? And a triangle. We don't want to compare the tree to a triangle. In fact, we don't want to compare the tree to anything like ice, cream, liquid, <laughs> We don't want to compare the tree to anything physical as an analogy because we're going to wind up, if you take that analogy in a certain direction, it'll be um, not aligned with the creed of Calcinon right there. So if you want to develop an analogy for the tree, you try your best because <laughs> people have been trying to do this for a long time. But make sure it aligns with the creed of Calcinon. So to clarify, you say God the Son is part of the Trinity, but not man the Son. Not Jesus the man. Yes, Jesus the man. Or let's put this way: His human nature is not part of the Trinity. Oh. Yeah. Okay, this is a good but discussion. Yeah. Great after this. Really, 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 really. you think about this? Okay, let's 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 continue through this. Okay, we have only 15 minutes, and I have like 15 pages to go. <laughs> so. The disciple, the other challenge we're faced with, the other challenge, you may not have heard this, and this is why you came to the box, because I'm bringing you stuff you're not going to get anywhere, I'm telling you. Um, but people say this sort of stuff. They say the disciples of Jesus merely copied from the life of Apollonius of Tyana to create the story of Jesus. You're going, well, who the heck is Apollonius of Tyana? Oh my God. I've never heard of him. So that's. So Apollonius of Tyana is a figure back in the uh, first century, and uh, one, before we go into it, I want to tell you a little bit more. This is not a new challenge. In the third century, parallels were drawn by uh, this guy named Hieriopolis, and he was the proconsul of this place called Bithynia under the Roman emperor Diocletian. And he basically was arguing against Christianity at the time, using this guy, Apollonius of Tyana, to, to argue against Christianity. What he was saying is essentially that the miracles that Apollonius of Tyana did were comparable to the miracles Jesus did, but no one makes Apollonius of Tyana into a god like you Christians are with Jesus. And so he was saying that people are more rational than that. Apollonius of Tyana did stuff that was much better documented by more respectable people, and no one's claiming Apollonius of Tyana is God. So this challenge resurfaced again in the 1800s in, in Germany with that uh, German school of history that we talked about. And it's now a very popular challenge today. And you get this often online. Um, but it's a big, it's a big deal for, for the people. Now, there's a little picture of Apollonius that I dug up here um, just for you. Uh, it's an actual photo. He went to a photo booth at a wedding once, and I got him. So um, <laughs> this is him and um, a coin, actually, that they found. And this is exactly what it looked like by an artist rendering, but this is what it looks like. Part. This is an artist. Um, depiction of it. And in the real one, he has a hand coming up here. I don't know what he's doing with the hand, but it's in this area. And I'll just 
this statement out there when we talked about it. It wasn't a historical figure, but what do we do with this with this challenge that we're faced with? So Apollo Nias of Tiana lived at 3 BCE to 97 CE. So he lived a long time. Um, probably maybe not that long, somewhere in that range. Um, he lived and died. And allegedly he was a wise teacher, had followers, had supernatural powers, traveled around, appeared after he died. And as implied by his biographer, he ascended to heaven. Sound familiar? So this type of charge is very powerful because the, the critics use the similarities between Jesus and Apollonius and other figures of that time to draw parallels and say, look, Jesus isn't that unique. Jesus isn't that special. And you guys all think he's God. Well, all these other guys are just going to give you no one takes their mouth. So Apollonius, the religious teacher, um, he was a religious teacher and philosopher, and with his religious teaching, he went around and he lived this life of Pythagoras, as they called it. And um, he traveled to India and Ethiopia and Rome, and he was concerned with purifying the rites of these cults that he encountered along the way. He wanted to purify worship in these cultish temples that he, he found along the way. He was into astrology and, and divination. Uh, he prophesied, he performed miracles, including healings and casting out demons, allegedly. And so Apollonius, the philosopher, was heavily influenced by Greek thought at the time, which was prevalent across the Mediterranean world. So he developed the Neoplatonic Greek philosophy, as he went out. And essentially, um, you can cross out the word all there. Most of what we know, you can put most of what we know, is came from this sophist uh, teacher named Philostratus the Elder. Most of what we know is came from this guy, who lived about um, at least 70 years um, after Apollonius lived, and he wrote this book, New Life of Apollonius of Tyana. So this is a huge biography, and it's recorded to be the largest biography in the ancient world. Um, it's just ginormous. And um, this was written up around uh, 220 AD, and it would be about 150 years after um, Apollonius' life. So later on in Philostratus' life, he wrote about Apollonius. And um, this is um, well after the time span between the events of the New Testament and the Gospel writings. So it was 125 years after the Polynesian died. And with the biographies of Jesus, we have them all written within 60 years of his life. And the Synoptic Gospels are written within 30 years of Jesus' life. The Synoptic Gospels being Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so, thus, for Apollonius, there's more time for legendary development to creep in. You have a big time gap between when Apollonius lived and when Philostratus uh, wrote his biography. So it's highly likely, highly likely, that in the story time of Apollonius over the years, the embellishments are set in. This is why critics charge the, the gospel writers with legendary development, because of people like this, where you have this guy living, but 125 years later, he's all of a sudden doing all this, these miracles and wonder work and stuff. And so um, later on, it turns out that some people wound, wound up thinking that he was God, despite um, this guy, Heracles, that we first talked about, saying that um, no one thinks he's God. It turns out that some people later on, actually, who read the biography, even 100 years later, started thinking he was God-like. So they said that he was a God-like philosopher. And so the God-like description uh, did creep in um, when people thought about this guy, Polynesius. Um, for those who are familiar with Apollonius, despite Hierapolis' claim. Now, did people think of him as godlike? Well, Hierapolis says no. Well, but we have three authors in late antiquity who do just that. They say that he's godlike. Okay, so what do we do with that? Sounds a little bit like Jesus still. So another way to understand their claim, though, is to think of it as sarcasm. Some of these people were writing, actually, in response to Christians, who Christians who were Christian apologists at the time, were writing against Apollonius in, in the Philostratus account. And so these three authors that think that say he was godlike actually um, may be sarcastic. They may are, are be saying essentially that, oh yeah, he's God, you know, this guy is a miracle, so he's God, just like the Christians think Jesus was God, yeah, you know, that sort of thing. And so um, we have a few options here. We have a similar trilemma that C.S. Lewis presented with us. He's either um, not godlike, or he's godlike, or he's or he's sarcastic. 
So what do we do with this? Well, let's think through it. You either have um, the legend of godlikeness, he's actually godlike, or it's sarcasm. So you have um, this description written 200 years after Apollonius came. So this is not similar to the accounts of Jesus again, as his Jesus' disciples immediately after his life uh, basically said that Jesus was God. And so this is very different than the Apollonius account. Jesus thought he was God, claimed to be God, and proved he was God, as evidenced in the preceding stuff we talked about. Now, none of this is your notes, but I'm getting back to your notes in a second. Um, so legend most likely developed in the Apollonius' account, um, and this is, is actually not sarcasm. Um, so it's, it's most likely that the legendary development crept in, that the godlikeness um, description was put on the philosopher description when, when describing this philosopher and miracle work of God. And so of the entire limit, sarcasm doesn't make sense, and he wasn't actually love like that doesn't make sense either. I'll tell you why I'm saying so. So it's clear that legendary development crept in and people thought, looked back and thought about this guy, Paul Adidas. Now, the reason why he's actually um, not godlike is very clear when you start looking into Philostratus' account a little further, mainly because Apollonius himself says he was not a divine person. So he makes that explicitly clear, which exactly we have the exact opposite of the Gospels. So, thinking through this a little bit more, getting out of that trilemma, coming back to your notes. If the New Testament documents are considered unreliable for any reason, such as dating or miracles, etc., how much more so would the life of Apollonius of Tyana be unreliable? So, some people say because the New Testament is filled with uh, miracle stories, or because the disciples wrote the Gospels 30 years after Jesus came, and critics say that that is unreliable because of those features, well, how much more so is a document by only one person? Uh, written 125 years after the guy came lived and died. So it turns out that the New Testament comparison is very reliable and enjoys independent meditative attestation and wide acceptance uh, by scholars, including, um, you know, add to that, uh, the multiplicity of manuscripts, which we talked about in the middle of the politics class in uh, January and February. Now, however, the same is not enjoyed by the biography of Apollonius. You don't have a multiplicity of copies, you don't have independent attestation, and you don't have wide scholarly acceptance. So, is the biography of Apollonius credible as an actual historical fact? No. So, um, the next point we can make is the after, uh, etc. there other than uh, the Philostratus account. You can cross out other than and write after. After the Philostratus account, we have only mentions of Apollonius here and there in the next several centuries. We only have mentions of it. But before the Philostratus account of Apollonius, we actually have four texts that are available prior to that that give us information about the life of Apollonius. This is not your notes, but essentially we can gather some minimal evidence about who he was. And what we find is that he was a wonder worker, he was a philosopher, he lived in an ascetic kind of life, I mean, denying yourself like basic things um, or, or um, indulgences, if you will, and he wandered around the eastern part of the Roman Empire. <coughs> so we do, we can piece together at least that much about his life. We don't have a bunch of other things he did, um, like transport himself across the region immediately, uh, things like that that are written in the Philostratus account. So they don't talk about him being God, thinking of himself as God, showing people that he is God. Nothing like that is provided in these four other accounts of life. They're very small and minimal. So how did Philostratus um, get all of this information he had about Apollonius? Well, apparently, uh, it says there allegedly, you can cross that out too, that's a mistake, I, I realized this weekend. Uh, allegedly cross that out. It turns out that Apollonius actually did write some letters and Philostratus included those. Now, it could be the case that Philostratus was actually making up Apollonius' letters, but it's probably likely that he recovered the original letters Apollonius actually wrote, and those are all included in the three-volume set that is available on the Web Classic Library. You can just search for that, and it's housed by Harvard University. And what it is, is a library of all of these classic pieces of antiquity 
that have been preserved somehow and are available online to be researched and, and whatever. Um, and so it's loeb, L-O-E-B, classics.com. And you can check that out and search for like thousands of classics available from um, ancient history. Now, uh, these letters are available, and uh, you can check those out. So Philostratus reportedly had a diary from the one and only disciple of Apollonius. The disciple's name was Danis, D-A-N-I-S. And um, those diaries are lost. So we don't have anything to validate what Philostratus is saying about Apollonius. It's just like we have with the Mormons and the, and the Quran with the Muslims. You have a book they being delivered allegedly from heaven and put in the hands of Joseph Smith and Muhammad. And in a similar way, you have Phil Strauss saying that he had these tablets, it's always tablets. Um, and these tablets came from Damas, his one and only disciple. But the tablets are lost. So we don't have a lot of uh, credibility already here that um, shows that he was getting this from an actual uh, source. Now, however, uh, the New Testament in comparison is filled with writings reflecting the common beliefs of the early church. People who had these beliefs immediately after Jesus died and was risen again. So you have immediate information available right after the death of Jesus um, about it, uh, Jesus being God, his miracles, his divinity, his messiahship, and everything else. And we have uh, several books in the Bible, 27 New Testament books and 17 biblical books, all referencing Jesus and his life ministry and his followers. So we have multiple books in the Bible about the figure of Jesus, and we only have one book essentially showing off the, the cool stuff of Apollonius that's from Philostratus, this big biography. So, based on the lack of corroborating evidence, we don't have a lot of corroborating evidence here with uh, Philostratus. And the late David writing, it was written way after, 125 years after Apollonius came. Scholars consider the biography of Apollonius to be less reliable than any New Testament document. And the biographies of Jesus were written by eyewitnesses, whereas Philostratus was not an eyewitness, he was not even alive, and he was um, consulting these other sources. So Philostratus even reports in his writing that some people say, or it is reported, these sorts of things. So it doesn't sound like Philostratus is extremely confident in what he's saying because he's apparently allegedly getting it from these tablets. Now, this is not like the strong eyewitnesses, eyewitness account that we have in the biographies of Jesus, where we have people that actually saw what Jesus did in miracles for themselves and are telling you about it right after the fact. So, in comparison, you have a very washed down account of this person's um, supernatural sort of lifestyle. Now, if any copying was done, this is the charge that the disciples copied from Apollonius of Tyana. If any copying was done, it was the other way around. It is clear that Philostratus would have copied from the first century documents, which were already circulating at the time that Philostratus wrote his biography. It would be impossible for the disciples to copy from Philostratus because he lived 200 years, and the book was written 250 years after Jesus, 220 years after Jesus. So that would be impossible. So most likely, Philostratus actually copied the New Testament writings and the early church fathers were certainly those in Philostratus probably already knew about them. Now, I'll end with this. Um, you can read on there. Um, this empress, Julia Domna, Domna commissioned Philostratus to write his biography, Apollonius' biography. So he said, she said, hey, you, I need to write, make a book about this guy. And what happened was her son had this um, a strong affection for Apollonius. And she may have asked uh, Philostratus to, to um, put in a little bit of fable in there so that her son would read it and have a nice book to read um, for, for like a child, for instance. So maybe she asked him to add in legendary development. Um, if she didn't ask him, he probably would put it in anyway because he's being paid for this. And the, he knew that the empress and the son already had an affinity towards Apollonius. Now, um, it's likely that he did that because of some of the things he says. Um, 
this claim of fabrication that I'm talking about is, is based on uncertainty, we don't know for sure, but fabrication may be the source of any embellishments, legend, or the supernatural elements that we have in the biography. So it's most likely fabrication. Um, now, interestingly, at the beginning of the book, Fulstratus hints at the fact that this is partial truth and partial fiction when he opens up about how Apollonius came to be considered a dead body man. So there's already some weird things going on there because here Heriopolis says that no one thought of this line. Now, other scholars chime in and talk about how um, there's legendary development that they can clearly read from these passages. Um, and they, and one scholar just uh, says that it's a work of fictional revisionism. And so, therefore, we can keep in mind that the New Testament writers had nothing to gain, everything to lose when they wrote their books, whereas uh, those trials would be paid. Now, um, you can continue to read on there. I make a few other statements. There were some apologetics guys at the time responding to those trials in this account, and um, it, they did the job as apologetics. Apologists, and they talked about the difference between Jesus and the Messiah. So whenever someone brings up a similarity sort of thing, they talk typically about Jesus was similar to this guy, or Jesus was similar to these mystery religion gods of the ancient Near East, these dying and rising messiahs with the agricultural um, ebbs and flows. Um, the, the thing we have to do is, is re recognize the similarities, but also emphasize the differences because the differences are extreme and the similarities are pretty minimal. So when this charge comes up, that's the, the tactic. So the differences don't just come to the similarities. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and close this session and um, let's close the prayer. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for bringing us here and we ask that you guide us as we go. Continue to open our eyes to the truth of who you are, all that you are your divinity, your human nature, and um, let us investigate that further and, and enhance our worship because of uh, this material tonight. And we pray your blessings in the name of Jesus.